could you please? It's just that I'm reading the selected short stories of Franz Kafka, and it takes some concentration. If you, oh no, you wouldn't want to hear a short story of Franz Kafka, not read by me. Well, maybe just a short one. Maybe just a short one. Josephine, the singer, or the mouse folk. Our singer is called Josephine. Anyone who has not heard her does not know the power of song. There is no one but is carried away by her singing a tribute all the greater as we are not in general a music-loving race. Tranquil peace is the music we love best. Our life is hard. We are no longer able, even on occasions when we have tried to shake off the cares of daily life, to rise to anything so high and remote from our usual routine as music. But we do not much lament that. We do not get even so far. A certain practical cunning, which admittedly we stand greatly in need of, we hold to be our greatest distinction. <laughs> and with a smile born of such cunning, we are wont to console ourselves for all shortcomings, even supposing only it does not happen that we were to yearn once in a way for the kind of bliss which music may provide. Josephine is the sole exception. She has a love for music and knows, too, how to transmit it. She is the only one. When she dies, music, who knows for how long, will vanish from our lives. I have often thought about what this music of hers really means, for we are quite unmusical. How is it that we understand Josephine's singing? Or, since Josephine denies that, at least think we can understand it. <laughs> the simplest answer would be that the beauty of her singing is so great that even the most insensitive cannot be deaf to it. But this answer is not satisfactory. If it were really so, her singing would have to give one an immediate and lasting feeling of being something out of the ordinary, a feeling that from her throat something is sounding which we have never heard before and which we are not even capable of hearing, something that Josephine alone and no one else can enable us to hear. But in my opinion, that is just what does not happen. I do not feel this, and have never observed that others feel anything of the kind. Among intimates, we admit freely to one another that Josephine's singing, as singing, is nothing out of the ordinary. Is it, in fact, singing at all? Although we are unmusical, we have a tradition of singing. In the old days, our people did sing. This is mentioned in legends, and some songs have actually survived, which, it is true, no one can now sing. Thus, we have an inkling of what singing is, and Josephine's art does not really correspond to it. So is it singing at all? Is it not perhaps just a piping? And piping is something we all know about. It is the real artistic accomplishment of our people, or rather, no mere accomplishment, but a characteristic expression of our life. We all pipe, but of course no one dreams of making out that our piping is an art, we pipe without thinking of it, indeed without noticing it. And there are even many among us who are quite unaware that piping is one of our characteristics. So if it were true that Josephine does not sing, but only pipes and perhaps, as it seems to me at least, hardly rises above the level of our usual piping, yet perhaps her strength is not even quite equal to our usual piping, Whereas an ordinary farmhand can keep it up effortlessly all day long besides doing his work. If that were all true, then indeed Josephine's alleged vocal skill might be disproved. But that would merely clear the ground for the real riddle which needs solving, the enormous influence she has. After all, it is only a kind of piping that she produces. If you post yourself quite far away from her and listen, or still better, post, uh, put your judgment to the test, whenever she happens to be singing along with others. By trying to identify her voice, you will undoubtedly distinguish nothing but a quite ordinary piping tone, which, at most, delivers a little from the others through being delicate or weak. Yet, if you sit down before her, 
it is not merely a piping. To comprehend her art, it is necessary not only to hear her, but to see her. Even if hers were only our usual workaday piping, there is, first of all, this peculiarity to consider that here is someone making a ceremonial performance out of doing the usual thing. To crack a nut is truly no feat. So no one would ever dare to collect an audience in order to entertain it with nut cracking. But if all the same one does do that and succeeds in entertaining the public, then it cannot be a matter of simple nut cracking. Or it is a matter of nut cracking, but it turns out that we have overlooked the art of cracking nuts because we were too skilled in it. And that this newcomer to it first shows us its real nature, even finding it useful in making his effects to be rather less expert in nut cracking than most of us. Perhaps it is much the same with Josephine's singing. We admire in her what we do not at all admire in ourselves. In this respect, I may say she is one, she is of one mind with us. I was once present when someone, as of course often happens, drew her attention to the folk piping everywhere going on, making only a modest reference to it. Yes, for Josephine, that was more than enough. A smile so sarcastic and arrogant as she then assumed, I have never seen. She, who in appearance is delicacy itself, conspicuously so even among our people who are prolific in such feminine types seemed at that moment actually vulgar she was at once aware of it herself by the way with her extreme sensibility and controlled herself at any rate she denies any connection between her art and ordinary piping for those who are aware of the contrary opinion she has only contempt and probably unacknowledged hatred. This is not simple vanity for the opposition with which I too am half in sympathy. Certainly admires her no less than the crowd does, but Josephine does not want mere admiration. She wants to be admired exactly in the way she prescribes. Mere admiration leaves her cold, and when you take a seat before her, you understand her. Opposition is possible only at a distance. When you sit before her, you know this piping of hers is no piping, since piping is one of our thoughtless habits. One might think that people would pipe up in Josephine's audience, too. Her art makes us feel happy, and when we are happy, we pipe. But her audience never pipes. It sits in mouse-like stillness, as if we had become partakers in the peace we long for, from which our own piping, at the very least, holds us back. We make no sound. Is it her singing that enchants us, or is it not rather the solemn stillness enclosing her frail little voice? Once it happened while Josephine was singing that some silly little thing in all innocence began to pipe up too. Now, it was just the same as what we were hearing from Josephine. In front of us, the piping sound that despite all rehearsal was still tentative, and here in the audience, the unself-conscious piping of a child, it would have been impossible to define the difference. But yet at once, we hissed and whistled the interrupter down, although she would certainly have crawled away in fear and shame, whereas Josephine struck up her most triumphal, tri triumphal, mm, triumphal notes and was quite beyond herself, spreading her arms wide and stretching her throat as high as it could reach. That is what she is like always. Every trifle, every casual incident, every nuisance, a creaking in the parquet, a grinding of teeth, a failure in the lighting incites her to heighten the effectiveness of her song. She believes, anyhow, that she is singing to deaf ears. There is no lack of enthusiasm and applause, but she has long learned not to expect real understanding as she conceives it. So all disturbance is very welcome. To her, whatever intervenes from outside to hinder the purity of her song to be overwelcome, to be overcome with a slight effort, even with no effort at all, merely by confronting it, can help to awaken the masses, to teach them not perhaps understanding, but awed respect. And if small events do her such service, how much more do great ones? 
Our life is very uneasy. Every day brings more surprises, apprehensions, hopes, and terrors, so that it would be impossible for a single individual to bear it all did he not always have by day and night the support of his fellows. But even so, it often becomes very difficult. Frequently, as many a as a thousand shoulders, shoulders are trembling under a burden that was really meant only for one pair, then Josephine holds that her time has come. So there she stands, the delicate creature, shaken by vibrations especially below the breastbone, so that she feels anxious for her, so that one feels anxious for her. It is as if she has concentrated all her strength on her song, as if from everything in her that does not directly subver subserve her singing, all strength has been withdrawn, almost all power of life, as if she were laid bare, abandoned, committed merely to the care of good angels, as if, while she is so wholly withdrawn and living only in her song, a cold breath blowing upon her might kill her. But just when she makes such an appearance, we who are supposed to be her opponents are in the habit of saying, she can't even pipe. She has to put such a terrible strain on herself to force out not a song, we can't call it a song, but some approximation to our usual customary piping. So it seems to us. But this impression, although, as I said, inevitable, is yet fleeting and transient. We, too, are soon sunk in the feeling of the mass that warmly pressed body to body listens with indrawn breath. And to gather around her this mass of our people who are almost always on the run and scurrying hither and thither for reasons that are often not very clear, Josephine mostly needs to do nothing else than to take up her stand, head thrown back, mouth half open, eyes turned upwards in the position that indicates her intention to sing. She can do this where she likes. It need not be a place visible a long way off. Any secluded corner pitched on in a moment's caprice will serve as well. The news that she is going to sing flies round at once, and soon whole processions are on their way there. Now, sometimes, all the same, obstacles intervene. Josephine likes best to sing just when things are most upset, and many worries and dangers force us then to take devious ways. With the best will in the world, we cannot assemble ourselves as quickly as Josephine wants, and on occasion she stands there in ceremonial state for quite a time without a sufficient audience. Then indeed she turns furious, then she stamps her feet, swearing in most unmaidenly fashion. She actually bites, but even such behavior does no harm to her reputation. Instead of curbing a little her excessive demands, people exert themselves to meet them. Messengers are sent out to summon fresh hearers. She is kept in ignorance of the fact that this is being done. On the roads all around, sentries can be seen posted who wave on newcomers and urge them to hurry. This goes on until at last a tolerably large audience is gathered. What drives the people to make such exertions for Josephine's sake? There is no easier answer than the first question about Josephine's singing with which it is closely connected. One could eliminate that and combine them both in the second question, if it were possible to assert that because of her singing, our, our people are unconditionally devoted to Josephine. But this is simply not the case. Unconditional devotion is hardly known among us. Ours are people who love slyness beyond everything, without any malice, to be sure, and childish whispering and chatter, innocent, superficial chatter, to be sure, but people of such a kind cannot go in for unconditional devotion, and that Josephine herself certainly feels that is what she is fighting against with all the force of her feeble throat. In making such generalized pronouncements, of course, one should not go too far. Our people are all the same devoted to Josephine, only not unconditionally. For instance, they would not be capable of laughing at Josephine. It cannot, it can be admitted in Josephine there is much to make one laugh. And laughter for its own sake is never far away from us. In spite all the misery of our lives, quiet laughter is always, so to speak, at our elbows. But we do not laugh at Josephine. Many a time I have had the impression that our people interrupt their relationship to Josephine in this way, that she... This frail creature, needing protection, and in some way remarkable, in her own opinion, remarkable for her gift of song, is entrusted to their care, and they must look after her. The reason for this is not clear to anyone, only the fact seems to be established. But what is entrusted to one's care, one does not laugh at. To laugh would be a breach of duty. The utmost malice, which the most malicious of us, 
reek on Josephine is to say now and then the sight of Josephine is enough to make one stop laughing. So the people look after Josephine, much as a father takes into his care a child, whose little hand one cannot tell whether in appeal or command is stretched out to him. One might think that our people are not fitted to exercise such paternal duties, but in reality they discharge them, at least in this case, admirably. No single individual could do what in this respect the people as a whole are capable of doing. To be sure, the difference in strength between the people and the individual is so enormous that it is enough for the nursling to be drawn into the warmth of their nearness, and he is sufficiently protected. To Josephine, certainly, one does not dare mention such ideas. Your protection isn't worth an old song, she says then. Sure, sure old song, we think, and besides her protest is no real contradiction. It is rather a thoroughly childish way of doing and childish gratitude, while a father's way of doing is to pay no attention to it. Yet there is something else behind it which is not easy to explain by this relationship between the people and Josephine. Josephine, that is to say, thinks just the opposite. She believes it. She, she believes it is she who protects the people. When we are in a bad way politically or economically, her singing is supposed to save us. Nothing less than that. And if it does not drive away the evil, at least gives us the strength to bear it. She does not put it in words or in any other. She says very little how she is silent among the chatterers. It flashes from her, from her eyes, on her closed lips. Few among us can keep their lips closed, but she can. It is plainly legible. Whenever we get bad news, and on many days bad news comes, thick and fast at once, lies and half-truths included, she rises up at once, whereas usually she sits listlessly on the ground. She rises up and stretches her neck and tries to see over the heads of her flock like a shepherd before a thunderstorm. It is certainly a habit of children in their wild, impulsive fashion to make such claims, but Josephine's are not quite so unfounded as children's. True, she does not save us, and she gives us no strength. It is easy to stage oneself as a savior of our people, inured as they are to suffering, not sparing themselves. Swift in decision, well acquainted with death, timorous only to the eye in the atmosphere of reckless daring, which they constantly breathe, and as prolific besides as they are bold it is easy i say to stage oneself after the event as the savior of our people who have always somehow managed to save themselves although at the cost of sacrifices which make historians generally speaking we ignore historical research entirely quite horror struck and yet it is true that in that just in emergencies we hearken better than at other times to josephine's voice the menaces that loom over us make us quieter, more humble, more submissive to Josephine's domination. We like to come together. We like to huddle close to each other, especially on occasion set apart from the troubles preoccupying us. It is as if we were drinking in all haste. Yes, <laughs> yes, haste is necessary. Josephine too often forgets that. From a cup of peace in common before the battle. It is not so much a performance of songs as an assembly of the people and an assembly where except for the small piping voice in front, there is complete stillness.